I'm in a mood. Yes, you are, he said. <clears throat> Let's pray. Ask God's blessing upon our time together. <clears throat> Oh, dear Lord, we are excited about the possibilities that serving you and following you and being united in you, connected to you, uh, brings to us. And we pray you'll help us tonight in an age where folks are pretty down about life itself, to live in the sunshine of the opportunity of counting for eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight I'm going to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. <clears throat> this is one of the I am statements uh, Jesus makes in the Gospel of John. It is a metaphor that he uses to illustrate a, a truism about the Christian life. And the truism is, is that we, when we get saved by the uh, sovereign grace of God and the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit, we are connected to Christ. Um, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 12, we're baptized in, into Christ. Uh, here, Jesus is going to talk about that connection, the, the theological term that we use to describe this whole uh, theological teaching is union with Christ. And it comes out of those expressions, uh, Christ in us and we are in him. Sometimes the Bible says each of those and, and it, just, it just talks about the very intimate and permanent connection we have with Christ. Well, that's in the background here in what Jesus says. <clears throat> I'm gonna read verses one through five. But I want to preach on verses 4 and 5. Tonight, the title of my sermon is The Joy of Fruit Bearing. The Joy of Fruit Bearing. <clears throat> Verse 1. Jesus speaking says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that does bear fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit verse three already you are clean because of the word that i've spoken to you now my text verses four and five abide in me and i in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine neither can you unless you abide in me I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, I want to divide my comments about this passage under the heading of the joy of fruit bearing into. Uh, three sections. Uh, first, I uh, will talk about an instruction, instruction that comes from this. Second, a promise uh, granted to us through this text. And finally, the application of the passage to our lives. Let's think first about the instruction. <clears throat> In verses four and five, and indeed the entire uh, paragraph itself, Jesus uh, instructs us on this vital relationship that every Christian has with, with him in the saving sense. And there are two parts uh, to the instruction that I want to call to your attention tonight. One is instruction about the relationship we have with him. And second, we'll talk about his instruction concerning the responsibility we have in view of the relationship. So how does he instruct about the relationship? Well, the relationship is characterized in a number of ways. By the way, it is a relationship. Uh, let me pause, marginal comment, and say we cannot understand salvation without understanding that, uh, that salvation 
uh, is built on a relationship. If you're saved, you, the scripture says, have a relationship with the Father through Christ. And if you don't have a relationship with God, you can't be saved. Does that make sense? So you could be trained in theology. You could, you could make straight A's in a theological class and be lost as a goose. My apologies to the geese for having said such a thing. Why? Because it's not about, the devil could pass a theology test, but he's not saved because he doesn't have the relationship with the Father. Remember what Jesus said in John 17 in his high priestly prayer, verse 3, this is eternal life that they may know you. So when we're talking to people about salvation, let's not forget to say it's coming into a personal relationship with God the Father through faith in Christ. And that's in view here. How does Jesus instruct us about this relationship? Several things I want to say about that. First, there's reciprocity. Is that a new word to you? Reciprocity. And, and I think you'll see that in, in, in the way he says a number of things. For, for example, in verse 4, abide in me and I in you. Do you sense the reciprocity? So Jesus is in me and I am in him. So it's going both ways. That's reciprocity. We, we both engage. He engages with me by abiding in me. Christ is in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27. If you're saved, Christ is in you, and he's abiding in you, but you're abiding in him. You seek to abide in him, and he abides in, in you. Reciprocity. However, the relationship is unique in that it is an interrelated superiority and dependence first there's superiority who's superior jesus or me get it right jesus and who's dependent we are who's dependent on who we're dependent upon jesus jesus is superior to us so his call is for us to abide in him as he abides in us i think that's very very important and by the way i think that has relevancy to my sermon sunday morning by the way, Sunday morning, I get to preach on anything I want in the Scripture. Feels really good. And I'm going to settle in on Matthew 16 where Peter blew it. Where he rebuked Jesus. Don't do that. Don't rebuke Jesus. I can't preach my sermon tonight. That's Sunday, Megan. I'm going to hold it off. But the point is, he thought he, he, was, he was too big in his own mind. He had it figured out. Ooh. Jesus is telling us here, look, I'm the vine. You're the branch. You depend on me. I don't need you. The vine can live without the branch. The branch cannot live without the vine. There's an interrelatedness that includes superiority and dependence. And then the relationship involves intimacy and possibility. I like that. Intimacy. I want to press that a bit. I don't want to sit, talk a long time about it, but there's intimacy in your relationship with Jesus. There's closeness. This abiding implies a sense of we're together in the closest possible way. In knowledge, in concern. In, in love, intimacy. And there's possibility. Where does the possibility come in? Much fruit bearing will occur if you bear, if you abide in me. All of this is tied in to this idea of relationship. As we abide in him, as he abides in us, as we depend upon him, as we stay connected to him, as we enjoy intimacy and and all that is a part of that, there becomes a possibility that my life can count 
by bearing. Jesus says in verse 5, bearing much fruit. Much. I love that. <laughs> You're not just, you know, when you put out tomato plants, you hope for good-sized tomatoes. Not just these little wimpy tomatoes. Unless, unless they're cherry tomatoes. Cherry tomatoes, they're supposed to be wimpy tomatoes. But if you, if you put a big boy out there, whatever they have, the hybrids they have today, you're, gonna, you're looking for a real meaty, large tomato. Much fruit. Just fruit just born all through life. That comes from this relationship. And there's a possibility here that I'll come back to. So we're instructed in the relationship, but we're also instructed in the responsibility that goes along with the relationship. Did you know, boy, do Christians need to remember this? We are responsible because we're saved. <laughs> because we're saved, there's stuff we're supposed to do. Jesus digs into that. What does he say? Well, he says we're supposed to do a couple of things. One, we're supposed to remember the relationship. <laughs> he says, look, Jesus speaking says, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Do you remember that? Christians that have no habit of going to church are forgetting that. Christians that have no habit of reading their Bibles are forgetting that. Christians that haven't prayed in months are forgetting that. There are things you need to do to abide in Christ. Now, it's not to suggest you can and will lose your salvation. We're not saying that. But you're not, you're not connected to the relationship that you have in Jesus Christ. We could add the word fellowship. The relationship implies the need for fellowship. Remember it. Don't forget it. We're also responsible to abide in Christ because of that relationship. Do something about it. And that is the only way to bear fruit according to Jesus. That's the instruction. Now let me add, in addition to the instruction, the promise. The promise is good. It's so prominently displayed here. Verse 5, B part. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Notice the condition of this promise. Whoever abides in me and I in him. Look, Jesus doesn't say lay on the couch spiritually and you'll bear a lot of fruit. Be lazy and you'll bear a lot of fruit. Jesus says if you abide in me. There is something of an engagement going on here. You have to work at it. You have to put yourself into it. You have to, you have to plan. You have to be intentional. You have to invest yourself into it. And yes, it's true that whenever you're sick or tired or weary or just want to give up, Jesus certainly carries you until you catch your wind. But the time comes when he says, okay, it's time to stop being lazy. Get back to work. <laughs> you don't like that, do you? Not getting amen. Soon. That's a condition. If you abide in me. Second, there's a comfort. This promise has a comfort. If you abide in him and he in you, you bear much fruit. And that's really at the heart of kind of what I want to emphasize tonight. Is I find that incredibly comforting. It doesn't say you have to be smart to bear fruit. It doesn't say you have to be theologically trained to bear fruit. It doesn't say you have to be uh, an incredibly beautiful person to bear fruit. It says you have to abide in Jesus to bear fruit. And if you're a Christian, you can do that. You better do that. Your life can count. But there's a caution. There's a condition, a comfort, but a caution. He cautions us. In verse 5, by saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So how are you going to do something? By abiding in him. The problem is if you walk away from him, you're not bearing any fruit. That's the promise. And it's various parts. Now the application. Okay, here's where it gets real practical. 
Let me suggest four things that this means. And this strikes at my heart, and it better strike yours. This is life at its fundamental place. Number one, Christian, you never get done with Jesus. You never get done with Jesus. I am so tired of Christians thinking about salvation like, okay, I've done that. I'm good to go. That rings to me like I'm done. You're not ending something when you get saved. You're beginning something when you get saved. You never get done with faith. You never get done with Jesus. You never get done with holiness. You never get done with the Bible. You never get done with going to church. You never get done with doing right. You're never done with Jesus. Okay? And that idea of abiding in him, you don't get separated from me. You got to abide. That, that implies that, doesn't it? You hang on to him as if he's life because he is. Number two, Christian, and I know I'm going to have to explain this one, but that's okay, I will. Christian, you must choose Jesus every day. Is the preacher saying you get saved every day? No, but you choose him. How do you choose him? You get up and you say, Lord, I want to live for you today. Lord, help me to do right today. When you go to bed at night, say, Lord, I messed up a couple of times. I'm sorry. Would you wipe that out and help me to do better tomorrow? Lord, I love you. Lord, I messed up. That person at the store Talk to me about church, and I got scared, and I didn't say anything about what I should have been talking about. Give me courage the next time. I mean, you, you make choices every day of your life to be faithful to him. You get up in the morning. I got, I'm so excited. I got a new alarm clock, and it's got these sounds on it. And one of the sounds is the ocean. And I can wake up to the ocean. Early Sunday morning, I wake up to the ocean saying, go to church. Go preach the word. Make that choice today. Third, Christian, you can count. And you will count for eternity. If you abide in Christ. Lord, what can I say to help communicate? This? I'm just reading an article today. Baptist Press put out. About the hopelessness. The, the rise in mental health problems in our young people. It's incredible. And I walked away from that thinking. We've got the answer. The answer is not a psychiatrist in a book he writes. The answer is Christ. The answer is hope. The answer is my life can be something special because Jesus will use me. He can love me and I can know him and he can use my life. And I want you to feel that the devil wants to put you down. Jesus wants to use you for his glory and honor. Do you believe that? Even you? Someone said, I heard him say it many years ago. I can't do anything. I have no gifts. And I just wanted to beat them with a wet noodle. Now that's pretty innocuous, I think, unless the noodle's too big, and that's another issue. But I wanted to come up, and I just want to say, don't say that. Don't tear down what God has created in making you. Find what you're good at. You may be grinning. Are you good at grinning? Some of you aren't. Maybe you need to stand at the door, welcoming people, and grin at them. Do you like children? Go work in the nursery. Hug the kids for Jesus. Do something with what God gave you. You can count now and for eternity if you just understand that abiding in Him and loving Him and worshiping Him and serving Him puts you in a position to count for eternity. Four. Now I'm really going to preach. Christian, don't substitute for Jesus. 
Don't substitute for Jesus. Tell somebody. You know, it's funny. Somebody will come up and say, may I be honest? What do you say to that? No, be dishonest. What, have you been lying? Oh, hold on. Man. I've been to more preacher meetings than I can shake a stick at. And almost every one of them frustrates the devil out of me. You know why? Because preachers end up talking about programs. Programs never saved anybody. Did you know that? A great Sunday school program is important in its place, but it never saved a single soul. And we spend untold thousands and tens of thousands of dollars to talk about stuff that in and of itself cannot save. And we have Jesus. And he can save. And we don't talk about him. Don't you substitute for Jesus. Jesus meant it. You abide in me. And you'll bear much fruit. What's important is me. Talk about me. Praise me. Commend me. Explain me to others. Preach me. And may God help this church, our church, our beloved family of faith, to be so intoxicated with the vine that as branches we're just bearing fruit right and left because the vine and the branch are connected together. Does that encourage you? I hope it does. I hope you leave this place tonight, whenever you leave, saying, my life can count. I'm going to abide in Christ. I'm going to stick with him no matter what. May God help us to do that. Let's pray. Lord, help us to abide in you. Help us to make plans to abide in you. Help us to schedule to abide in you. Help us to manage our calendars to abide in you. Turn our hearts to you. Turn our minds to you. Turn our wills to you. Because you are the vine. We are the branch. We have nothing without you. But in you, connected to you, we have life and strength. And your life and strength will bear fruit in us. We pray, oh God, you'll do that. In Jesus' name.